This is a presentation of some simple free energy devices, but please understand clearly that this presentation must not be thought of as an encouragement that you should attempt to construct anything shown or discussed here, as this presentation is for information purposes only. To start with, let's discuss the this system designed by Zach West in America. Zach has run a 250cc motorcycle uh, without using petrol. The fuel appears to be water and he's driven his motorcycle on the open road and it performs very well indeed. Uh, he uses electrolysis of water with a, a home-built electrolyzer and he bleeds off most of the oxygen uh, making the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen far less volatile and he stores some of this in a tank, a pressure tank ready for increases in load such as accelerating away from traffic lights. His system is shown in the diagram here. First of all you have a water container which is an airtight cap the water container feeds water to a series of separate electrodes encased in their own separate plastic pipes inside a box. The gas resulting from this is fed directly into a bubbler which in his case is a tall, perhaps very tall we should say, um, container filled with water. The container has a dividing partition at the top and he has an electromagnet attached lower in the bubbler itself and the uh, electricity passing through the coils of this electromagnet cause the separation of the charged particles of hydrogen and oxygen as they rise up through the water. This gives a certain degree of separation between the two gases and the oxygen is vented through a one-way valve out to the open air and the predominantly hydrogen section is passed on to a pressure tank which ra raises the pressure eventually to about 30 pounds per square inch and that is though it's marked here as uh, hydrogen atoms, uh, or hydrogen molecules I should say, is actually hydrogen atoms primarily, though given time the hydrogen atoms would combine to form hydrogen molecules. But that pressure tank feeds on through an ordinary standard throttle arrangement to the engine of the motorcycle. The electrical part of this is powered by the 6 volt battery of the motorcycle system it goes through an electronics board to feed the electrolyzer and it feeds the electrolyzer through the uh, electromagnet which is used to give a partial separation between the mixture of oxygen and hydrogen. The individual electrolysis units that are stored inside the battery are made from 10 inch lengths of plastic pipe with caps top and bottom and uh, the water pipe that feeds water in is terminated effectively by the water level inside. So this is a system that is operated by the pressure of ordinary air. But the electrodes that he uses are unusual. Uh, he uses uh, 5 inch by 10 inch, that's 125 millimeters by 250 millimeters, uh, length of uh, shim stock stainless steel is 310 um, grade uh, stainless steel and he has wound these thin flexible plates around and around using spacers to make sure that they stay separated um, into this spiral arrangement here 
which uh, forms the heart of the particular electrode set. Now he uses a, a considerable number of these things, uh, typically eight at a time, to feed the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen onto a system. Now this is a very direct and simple system. He uses a standard commercial 30 amp uh, pulse width modulator or DC pulsar sometimes called a, a, um, an electronic motor speed control. They are readily available on the market and that's what he uses to feed electricity to the units which produce the electrolysis. He uses a gas reservoir, as we said before, to give extra gas availability for sudden acceleration. Uh, he makes the reservoir from a 4-inch diameter PVC pipe. Um, the pipe is sealed at each end with caps, and the incoming 10 millimeter pipe and the outgoing 10 millimeter pipe are sealed into the end caps, and that forms his gas pressure reservoir. So the system is he has an airtight water tank feeding water to his spiral electrodes which feeds gas directly to his tall bubbler. His particular bubbler is 14 inches tall and he has a one-way check valve to allow the oxygen to vent out and the mainly hydrogen goes off to a storage tank and there is a divider at the top so that bubbles that come out of the top don't mix and they're fed off in separate directions. That of course is not a perfect way to separate the gases but it lowers the amount of oxygen in the hydrogen-oxygen mix so that the mixture can then be compressed. Um, I wouldn't claim that this is a self-powered system. Uh, I would expect that to be really effective you would need to have a separate battery that you charge with a solar panel or from the mains if you wish but typically a solar panel and uh, you can then effectively make your motorcycle uh, a system which is operated effectively by solar panels. As well as being able to run a motorcycle it is possible to power an ordinary standby generator, a elec electrical generator, using electrolyzed water as the power source. This is something which is convenient for a large number of people. But you have to remember that the uh, efficiency of the small motors that are used to drive these generators is desperately low. A figure of 10% efficiency is often quoted when discussing these sort of devices. Now the advantage of the electrical generator is that the output from the generator can be used to produce the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen through electrolysis of water. The trouble is uh, the hydrogen-oxygen mixture has a flame front speed a thousand times faster than that of the droplets of petrol or gasoline that evaporate inside the cylinder of an engine, an internal combustion engine that is. That means that the spark in a an ordinary internal combustion engine is normally about 8 degrees before top dead center for using with petrol but you can't afford to do that with HHO the, or the hydrogen oxygen mix that is used to power a generator without petrol. So to avoid the problem 
um, one of the things that you can do is to add cold water mist and that turns into flash steam inside the cylinder due to the uh, heat that's released when hydrogen and oxygen recombine to form water. That effectively makes your uh, little generator engine operate as an internal combustion steam engine. The trouble though is you still have the problem that the spark is generally produced too soon in the system. But to get an overall grasp of how it works, um, you can, if you wish, bubble the hydrogen-oxygen mix through acetone. And when you do that, the timing doesn't need to be altered in the engine, uh, provided that you add cold water mist as described earlier. The overall concept is very straightforward. You have air coming into the motor of your generator, spinning the generator and providing uh, an output of mains voltage and or 12 volts voltage. The generator uh, is powered, um, or rather the generator powers the electrolyzer. The electrolyzer gas is pushed into the incoming air mixture and a water supply is fed through a venturi um, tube to give cold water mist entering the motor engine with the air that's coming in. This system can give kilowatts of excess energy and it's very convenient where there's no electrical grid. Now, the Venturi tube may not be familiar to you, but all it is is a small water supply tube which comes out through a pointed tube. The air passing over both sides of the Venturi tube draws out little droplets of water, very tiny droplets of water, so much so that it's generally referred to as cold water mist. So. In more detail, a system like this is you have your commercial arrangement of motor and generator. The generator provides electrical power to the electrolyzer, but for safety's sake, obviously, you put in a contact breaker. So if there's any form of problem with the electrolyzer, like a short circuit, then the contact breaker will disconnect it. You also have a gas pressure switch, so that if the pressure inside the electrolyzer builds up for some reason, like for instance this uh, outlet pipe is damaged and blocked off, then the gas pressure switch will disconnect the electrical power from the electrolyzer and there will be no further gas produced to increase the pressure. If things are normal, the gas comes out through this pipe and into the first of two bubblers. The bubbler um, washes out any of the uh, electrolyte used in the electrolyzer. That would typically be uh, KOH or NaOH, that is potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, both of which are pure uh, catalysts. They don't get used in the operation and they wouldn't normally come out of the electrolyte, but occasionally you can get fumes from the electrolyzer liquid coming out with the gas. But the first bubbler washes those out, goes into a pressurized tank. The pressurized tank has a, a pressure valve on it and it will vent to the outside air if the pressure gets excessive. The output is taken through a second bubbler to make completely sure that what is coming out is purely gas. And the gas mixture of hydrogen and oxygen go into the incoming air and the water mist that's produced to feed the motor. And that is a stationary system, or if you wish it can be mobile, but it's normally stationary. Um, and this is the way that it looks in full detail. If it's stationary, you can feed the water tank from the mains water supply. That provides water to both the incoming air in droplets or in bulk to through a water pump and a one-way valve 
into the electrolyzer itself. The protection system is as before, except that you have a starting battery which you can use to get gas in the electrolyzer if the system has been off for a long time and the electrolyzer doesn't have any significant gas in it. So when you start up the system with the battery, it powers up the electrolyzer, produces gas, the gas flows out through the bubbler, through a one-way valve into the tank, through the one-way valve out of the tank, through the second bubbler and a particle filter if you feel like it, to the incoming air which goes into the motor. And that is a good starting system uh, which works well. Now the thing that you need to understand is if you don't use a uh, a bubbler filled with acetone to feed the gas into the engine, you need to change the timing of the engine itself. Now the ebook which I've written has got detailed photograph and diagram pictures of how you can adjust and alter the timing of an ordinary standard generator of virtually any type. And that is something that is uh, within the capabilities of almost anyone, even if they're not familiar with motors. The information in the ebook showing how to alter the timing has come from Selwyn Harris of Australia and also from David Quarry of New Zealand showing his unmodified generator running on water. You can make your own electrolyzer if you wish, and all of the relevant information is in my ebook in chapter 10. But in brief outline, a properly built electrolyzer will have more than two electrodes in a body of water. And you apply 12 volts across them. Uh, and if you do that, then only 1.24 volts will be used in the DC electrolysis. And the remainder of the power goes to heat the water. So 1.24 volts creates gas and 10.76 volts creates heat in the water, heat in the um, uh, electrolyzer water, the electrolyte. The way that you overcome this problem is you use more than one pair of electrodes in separate bodies of electrolyte. In that case, if you use two of them, 2.48 volts is used to create gas and 9.52 volts makes heat in the water. If you use three cells together, three pairs of electrodes separated in separate bodies of uh, electrolyte, then 3.72 volts creates gas and 8.28 volts makes heat and only heat, which is not really helpful in most circumstances though admittedly in places like Canada, overnight where it's so cold and you're trying to stop everything freezing, it can be helpful. But um, for the maximum efficiency of ordinary DC electrolysis, you use six or possibly seven cells for 12 volts or 14 volts if you're feeding it from a car alternator. A car alternator produces 14 volts so that it can charge a 12 volt battery because the charging voltage has to be greater than the battery voltage at all times. But the way that the separate bodies of electrolyte are formed in a single housing is by embedding the, uh, the stainless steel electrode plates in the sides and bottom of the container which holds the water. The light blue indicates the water or electrolyte and the plates are shown here in two colours, a red and a blue, because people find it quite difficult to understand that the electrode plate between the two bodies of water is effectively the same as two separate cells with a wire connection between two separate electrode plates. So what happens is you have the plus 12 volts coming in, dropping 1.24 volts to this plate 
and dropping another 1.2 volts across the next one and so on down the length of the electrolyzer. This is a system that's used by Bob Boyce shown here. Bob is the most advanced and most experienced and possibly clever um, experimenter and developer using hydrogen and oxygen. Bob Boyce has produced a very high efficiency system for producing uh, a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen from an electrolyte, a water electrolyte. Let me explain this very clearly to you. Um, the system that Bob Boyce uses is uh, essentially an electrolyzer which would operate perfectly well on direct current. The electrolyzers are treated and conditioned and developed with um, pre-operational sequences uh, and filtering which end up with uh, an electrolyzer output which is more than twice that produced by Michael Faraday who's the first person to define what happens when you apply electricity to the electrodes in water. Now the thing is the scientific community generally consider that what Michael Faraday did was a definitive thing in electrolysis. That unfortunately is not the case because technology has moved on and the techniques developed by Bob Boyce are very very far beyond anything that Michael Faraday tried to do. Bob Boyce produced the um, system shown here which has uh, an advanced form of circuitry and it produces typically 12 times the output that Michael Faraday achieved. This is a system which accesses energy from the surrounding environment. That is done by using a special toroid wound with uh, three separate windings and driven by an electronics board which generates a signal into each of the three windings, a different frequency signal into each winding. And with that arrangement it draws in uh, electricity, excess electricity from the local environment. And that excess electricity is used um, through a 110 volt, in his case, AC inverter, producing from the 12 volts produced here into the a diode bridge and fed back as a high voltage into the electrolyzer itself which has got 101 stainless steel plates in it, in a series. There is protection, obviously, for the electrical circuit with a breaker and uh, a safety relay and so on. But this advanced system is extremely efficient and it can generate up to 100 litres of hydrogen-oxygen mix per minute. Now that has to be pulsed at a resonant frequency which means that you have to have a, an appropriate electronics board to drive this. There are full details in my ebook but um, a f ordinarily made DC electrolyzer is sufficient for running a generator on water alone but this system here that is produced by Bob Boyce is another very advanced system, much more so than just a simple generator system. This is a high powered, high output system. Um, you probably would have difficulty in visualizing what a hundred liters per minute actually is, but effectively it is uh, the amount of gas that will fill a one and a half liter soft drinks plastic bottle in just one second and that is very impressive. Moving on I'd like to draw your attention to a device which isn't a free energy generator 
but is one that I think you should be aware of. It was patented in 1961 by Elmer Grimes and it's for the large-scale extraction of water from air. The US patent is 2996897 so you can check it out yourself if you wish. It's so effective that it can be used in deserts and it has been used to supply a whole ranch in Texas in a dry year. Essentially this device is a refrigerator which chills a metal cone which has car style windscreen wipers attached to it and it pushes the condensed water off the cone. It actually uses both sides of the cone for efficiency and several cones are stacked in a vertical position inside a container. Looking down from the top you can see the pipes which carry the cooling liquid running around underneath the um, the curved downward sloping um, cone shaped metal sheet which covers the fluid pipes top and bottom. The little slots shown here in the outer cover are to allow air to flow through the system freely. It's very effective. You may not be aware of it but your ordinary refrigerator at home has a coefficient of performance of three or more. In other words you get three times the cooling effect that you would expect from the electricity supply. Now the whole thing is built into a container that looks something vaguely like a, a beehive. It has a sloping t uh, top and a motor inside that which drives the uh, windscreen wipers on all of the surfaces down below. The windscreen wipers are shown here as this dark piece that goes round the corner and operates both inside and outside wiping the water which is condensed on the plates off and down through the container and out through this pipe down here marked 18. The water system could be powered by any one of the free energy devices that have a reasonable output for example the Chas Campbell gravity powered or flywheel powered generator. While we're on the subject of common sense, low tech and simple common sense uh, devices, we should be aware of the system used during World War II when petrol was in short supply and diesel was in short supply to run internal combustion engines. This is a well-known system um, and what it does is it takes any solid fuel such as coal or wood chips and burns them in a container which has insufficient air to support the combustion. This produces a mixture of uh, carbon monoxide and methane and those gases when mixed with additional air can be burned in an internal combustion engine quite readily. This is a relatively dangerous type of system when you are refueling it because of the carbon monoxide which is produced in the uh, restricted burn area of the system. So what you have is a container which contains the material that you're going to burn and a, an ashtray which catches the burnt residue and that passes out through a filter system out and into the engine of whatever vehicle you're using to power it. You will see on this tractor this is the arrangement that produces the uh, fuel which runs the internal combustion engine of the tractor and that has worked very successfully with a lot of systems but if it the situation ever occurs that you have no access to conventional fuel and you want to run an internal combustion engine this is one way that it can be done. One of the old systems that is very frequently spoken of but considered to be 
pretty much of no use at all was the Homer Polar or N machine of Michael Faraday which he showed in 1831. The trouble with this system is it has a very low DC voltage output, typically less than a volt, although the output current can be a thousand amps. That combination suits electrolysis but very little else. I understand that Tiwari in India has used it to produce hydrogen which has powered uh, commercial buses but I've never seen any confirmation of that actually uh, in literature itself. The system is very simple. If you have a metal um, disc and the disc is rotated in a magnetic field in this case showing a, a U-shaped magnet the North Pole here, a South Pole the other side and if you have um, an electrical contact on the axle of the disc and on the outer edge of the disc you can get a very strong current when you rotate the disc itself. The same thing applies uh, if you choose to um, use say uh, mercury, liquid mercury as a contact for taking the um, electricity off. But it's a very difficult system to do and the problem is that what comes off is direct current. Um, the difficulty is that with direct current you're stuck with the very low voltage of typically a volt or less. So the experimentation was done in 1987 by three of the Borderland science team. That's Michael No, Peter Lindemann and Chris Carson. And they discovered a version which produces a sawtooth, sawtooth AC output. An AC or alternating current output allows a step-up transformer to be used raising the output voltage and lowering the output current. Their design has got four permanent magnets, ferrite permanent magnets, glued between two metal discs, one there, another there, and the uh, additional magnetics, the additional me mechanical strength um, is boosted by winding some copper wire around the outer edges because they weren't sure that the glue that they used would actually hold the magnets. But essentially speaking, you have a contact, metal contact, which presses against the outer metal um, disc uh, at two positions separated by 90 degrees. That sounds mad because you've got two metal contacts, with a piece of metal in between, which you would expect to be short circuit. But in spite of that, when you rotate the disc, you get an AC output. So they use a little motor to actually drive the disc round and round. They estimated the output current at 100 amps um, and they found that the output voltage was not affected by the speed of rotation but the frequency of the output of the AC was. Um, a spinning copper cylinder exerts a large sideways force on a permanent magnet placed near it. This doesn't happen with, the cyl with cylinders made from other metals. So, in passing, let me remark that copper and aluminium both have very strong magnetic effects, although people think that they're not magnetic because a permanent magnet will not stick permanently to either copper or aluminium. But this system produced by these experimenters is very interesting and has a lot of potential for various uses. Let me remind you again that if you decide to build anything as described here you do it entirely at your own risk. This is nothing to do with this presentation which is for information purposes only. If you want the notes that have been used during this particular talk 
You can download them from www.freeenergyinfo.com feSIG2.pdf but you get much fuller detail uh, if you download the free freeenergyinfo.com pjkbook.pdf uh, PDF file because it is considerably more detailed and should give you a much better insight into all of these things.